Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. I'm Sonny Bunch, culture editor uh, at The Bulwark. And I'm very pleased to be joined by a super special guest today. We don't we don't get guests like this too often. Jonathan V. Last of The Bulwark. How are you doing, Jonathan? Sonny, it's good to be with you. It's been a while. Uh, so usually, uh, usually on this show we have industry types or journalists talking about something going on, authors of new books about Hollywood, etc. But I wanted to talk to JBL today because uh, we 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 share we share a common goal and I think a common uh, a problem, which is that we like taking our kids to the movie theaters, and there's no movies for kids out in movie theaters like ever anymore. I, I just want I just want to like I want to work through this uh, this problem together because it's it is I think it's a real problem. Yeah, the, you know our our mutual friend Richard Rushfield has uh, a great rap about this when he talks about saving the theatrical experience and he says that what what people who think that streaming is everything don't understand is that there are classes of people who need movie theaters to go to. One of those classes of people are teenagers and people who go out on dates, young adults who who would like to uh, have romantic partnerships and need a thing to do. And the classic thing to do is to go to see a movie together with a person because then you have something to talk about over dinner. And dinner it, and a movie. Right. Uh, and the other is is parents because you need something to do with your children so that you don't accidentally murder them. And, uh, and, you know, like you can go to the playground, you could, you could only do so many things and going to a theater is one of them. And this is a reason that, uh, theatrical, you know, family films have become an incredibly important bedrock piece of IP for the people who still do them. I mean, the only, the only part of DreamWorks, which is worth anything anymore is the animation unit. Mm -hmm. DreamWorks animate, you know, DreamWorks is gone, but the DreamWorks animation unit lives on. Uh, the, the the Illumination Studios, which uh, has created the the, I don't know if it's the Gru or the Minions universe, but that thing is probably worth as much as Star Wars at this point in terms of intellectual property. Would you I disagree? See, I mean, no, I mean it's probably it's probably not worth quite that much, but it's it is certainly up I'm there. It's, I'd not, say it's, I'd, worth, it's worth as much as like Jurassic Park. I'd yeah. say. Yeah, incredibly yeah. valuable, uh, and and this is this is true of all the the Disney stuff, right? And so, uh, honestly, an underappreciated part of the Netflix strategy was building a massive kids library yeah. and having a, a kids on. So, having family family films can be a moat, uh, and it can be something that you can build on. And the, the, look for no better example of this than Disney, right? I mean, Disney. Disney's empire is built on family content, and uh, they've done it both through volume, but really through quality in that the, the Disney mark on a, a piece of content is such that you can basically know without thinking about it too hard that it's going to be fine for your kids, which, yeah. is, which is valuable to parents. <laughs> It is, and that's why, you know, this is why Disney has so much trouble trying to figure out what to do with Hulu and their 20th Century Fox acquisition. What are they going to do with that library? Do they put it on Disney Plus, where it's going to be kind of mingled in with, you know, uh, all the Pixar stuff, all the Disney Animation Studios, et cetera, et cetera? Or do they want to, you know, keep it on Hulu, where it'll be, right. where it can be kind of more easily segregated into adult and adult oriented content, uh, which is. It, it like in a way it's a good problem to have but it is still nevertheless a problem yeah def definitely is a problem and i i think that the future has disney and hulu integrating in a more real way uh this is you know it's funny we talk about website design all the time in our world but there is a real a real universe of app design for over the top streaming, which is still a very new frontier and mm -hmm. hasn't been a lot. You know, there's, there's only been a handful of companies who've done this at real scale. And the idea of taking these and merging them as properties and making it that you can go from within Disney to the Hulu or from within Hulu to the Disney, but you know, as if you're switching tabs on a web browser is probably where they have to go. It is. I mean, it's interesting uh, to hear you say that because I I think it actually works. I mean, look. So I don't I I don't know what your your setup is like at home. My over the top uh, system that I use most frequently is an Apple TV. 
So it's basically it's basically like looking at the desktop. It's basically look, like looking at the toolbar on my MacBook. Think about it that right. way, right? Where you you go from program to program. All right, I want to use TweetDeck now. I want to use. I'm just looking at my my toolbar right now. I want to I want to go from Safari. Okay, I'm done with Safari. I want to open up TweetDeck. All right, I'm done with TweetDeck. I need to get on Squadcast, so I got to open up Chrome, um, right? And that is that is how essentially I use uh, my Apple TV, right? Is I go from all right, I want to watch something on HBO Max. Okay, now I want to watch the season finale of. Sur- Severance, I got to go over to Apple TV Plus. Okay, now uh, I want to catch up on Winning Time. I got to go back to HBO Max. Um, uh, I never go to Netflix; it just kind of sits there. But you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, uh, but the but like I, I actually like that kind of separation, and I I don't I don't I don't think it necessarily makes sense for them to bring Hulu and ESPN because that's the other big Disney property, the right. other big Disney streaming property, into the same thing. I feel like those are. Well, different differentiated as three separate brands. I don't. Know. I mean, they would like you to never have to leave the app, right? I mean, they'd like one app to rule them all, and so that you can just toggle in the way that you do between profiles, right? Mm-hmm. That you could toggle between. I'm I'm in the Disney section now, the Disney neighborhood. Now I'm in the. Think of it like a theme park, right? You know, you're in Tomorrowland, and and then you're in Futureland, and then you're in. Great Americana, whatever. I don't. You were just at Disney. You remember yeah. all this stuff more than sure. I do. Yeah. But uh, you know, the other thing is, family movies are really good business. People don't. You know, currently the fourth highest grossing movie of this year is Sonic the Hedgehog two, which is amazing to me. Uh, and which I, you know, you and I do another show together. And the week before Sonic the Hedgehog two came out, I said to you, this movie is going to be a monster. And I know that sounds crazy. But I was hearing all the, like, you know, all the kids at my five-year-old's little Montessori school were talking about going to Sonic 2, which is a thing which has literally never happened in my life. Yeah. You know, I've did, just never, and it was just in the water. People wanted to uh, sing to is currently the eighth highest grossing movie. The Bad Guys, uh, number 10 for the year in 2022 and the bad guys is a bad movie i mean it's based on a a i think well-selling book series but it's not a not a great flick yeah and there there is there is a lot of uh pent up demand especially as we sort of exit covid world for parents who just want to get out of the house with their kids so we need more family movies, which I believe brings us to Chip and Dale and the question. So you have yep. a review up today about Chip and Dale and you ask in your review, why did this go straight to streaming? And I have a question for you about this because sure. I wondered if the reason it went straight to streaming was that that was what was required in the rights negotiations. Oh, that's a good question. That's actually a very good question. I don't know. I don't that know what the... If so, purchasing the rights would have been more expensive yeah. if it had been going to theatrical. Because do you want to just tell people right. briefly so, about the rights stuff from yeah, so, this movie? Yeah, so uh, Chippendale Rescue Rangers is... Imagine, like, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, um, uh, except with Chippendale, the two chipmunks from the er, late 80s, early 90s cartoon show that ran on the Disney Channel. Um, uh, but the, okay. the, the, the Chip and Dale were like a seventies creation but in is, theaters when I no, was a kid. No, but the, but Rescue Rangers was a show that ran in the okay. late eighties, yes. early nineties. Yes. It's a reboot of that specifically. Um, uh, and the, uh, again, imagine who framed Roger Rabbit where cartoons are living in the real world. They're essentially employed by movie studios as actors. They're not animated creations they are you know they they exist uh, unto themselves um and what this movie does is kind of like roger rabbit or at least at the end of roger rabbit it mixes all of the animated universes together so there are scenes where uh uh chip and dale are hanging out with ugly sonic who if if you folks remember uh sonic there was a there was a mild controversy about sonic the hedgehog when the first trailer came out he had terrible uh, human-like teeth so they got the, in in this universe, they got rid of that actor and replaced him with another actor who looked more like Sonic. Get it? <laughs> I did. So he so ugly Sonic. That's what he calls himself. Ugly Sonic goes and does the festival circuit. He, he's going to all the convention, whatever. Um. So that's the idea here. I'll give and, you an autograph for twenty bucks. <laughs> exactly. Uh, with that voice, with that terrible, uh, creepy voice. So the uh the the premise of the movie then uh basically takes all of these universes and mixes them together. There's a there there's a very brief uh, reference to Beavis and Butthead. Kind of like the Donald Duck Daffy um, Duck dueling piano scene from Roger Rabbit. 
which right, brings the yes. two iconic yes. ducks, one Disney, one, right. one Warner Brothers. Right. So, uh, so one of the, so getting, obviously getting all of these together in the same place is a massive IP headache to the point where, uh, Matt Bellany, who has been a guest on the show before reported in his, uh, newsletter this weekend that, uh, Bob Iger, very unusual for a, a, a executive at his level. He was then CEO of Disney, um, had to sign off on the script. Because they knew wow. it was going to be an enormous pain in the ass to get all of the all of the rights to this, and also because it's doing some kind of like vaguely dark things with some Disney IP. One of the the villain in this movie, I mentioned this in my review, but the villain in this movie is actually Peter Pan all grown up. And if you know anything about <laughs> uh, the history of Disney, the the original voice of Peter Pan was this kid Bobby Driscoll who was in a bunch of Disney stuff, and then like essentially aged out of being cute Disney kid and like died 10 years later in an empty lot in like Brooklyn oh. of drugs and, oh. and it, like was buried in a pauper's grave. Like it's like a whole, this whole horrible, sad story anyway. Um, but anyway, like this is not really part of the movie. That's just some, some extra stuff to keep in mind anyway. Uh, so, so it's a good question whether or not the rights issues required it to be streaming. If they, if they had to avoid, uh, if they if they had to avoid box office gross to you know secure rights from from Sega from uh, Warner Brothers everybody else Paramount uh, yeah. you know everyone, well, I assume everyone they who's purchased involved. these rights right I mean nobody I, just well, signed I mean, them for free I mean I assume I assume and this that, would keep the purchase price down if it was not going to go into yeah theaters. I mean I mean God only know I mean again who who knows exactly what the what the what the deals on all these are if they were paying for rights for all of these individual things I mean this would be like a two hundred million dollar movie. I mean, it would just be an in, insanely expensive movie. But then, as you say, maybe maybe keeping it in on streaming as opposed to in theaters uh, helps with that. But the uh, but the broader point. I mean, look, I I just I'm sitting here. I'm looking at uh, the theatrical release calendar. Right, you have uh, Sonic two, and then a couple weeks later, the bad guys, and then nothing for six weeks until yeah. Lightyear. What are we supposed I mean, to just, do? Just a wasteland. Won't you think of the, the parents? Kids. Think of the parents. Think of the kids. Think of the kids. Yeah. No, this is the little, you know, this is a, you know, it's a funny thing. I, I don't know about you. I, uh, I am not a sentimental Hallmarky type person about parenthood. I'm, I'm a, a realist, uh, real politique, real parented, or whatever it would be. Uh, but going to the theater with your kid when they are watching a movie that really hits them is a delightful experience, even if the movie is garbage, right? I mean, because you're, Sonic too was. you're not there, right? So this is, you know, I, I've told this story in another show. Uh, we're sitting there watching Sonic 2 on opening, opening night. I took him to opening night. And uh, Sonic 2 is a terrible movie. The first Sonic is actually quite charming in its own weird way, but Sonic 2 is not. Uh, but that did not matter to my child nor any other child in this absolutely packed theater at the Alamo Draft House, and it was so good that at one point my kid turns to the the dad on the other side of him, like just some other dad there with his three kids. He says to him, "Isn't this amazing?" <laughs> the dad, the dad looks over at my kid and gives him like the the Tom Hardy thumbs up from Mad Max, <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, but, you know, it's delightful going to see in a theater because it's different, right? Communal viewing experiences on a giant screen are as different as going the difference between listening to a CD of an opera and going to the Met to to see an opera. And uh, this idea that streaming can just replace that has always struck me as is wrong now streaming will be a thing right it already is a thing it will grow into some other thing it will change the way that we have theatrical experiences but it can't it can't replace it because what the theatrical experience is giving you is is something different it is a different good yeah i was uh, it was funny i was uh on twitter as i often am uh, uh last week and somebody was talking about taking their kids to the theater for the first time and how like how it was blowing their mind to see something on an actual giant enormous screen yeah. as opposed to watching on like on their, their iPad. iPad. Yeah. 
which is how you know kids consume uh, media this these days. I mean, I put my kids in front of the big screen. I don't. I'm like, you watch. You're you watch, watch it on the OLEDs. So you, you can appreciate the, the proper black levels. You need to look at this dynamic contrast from the colors. There's what there are ten million colors on this screen right now. Now this is you, true tone coloring that you're seeing. <laughs> this is not amped up saturation. This is, this is the HDR effect. Watch it. Watch it and learn. <laughs> Uh, so my kids are being raised right, but the, uh, but you know, most, most kids don't, they, they watch it on iPads or, or Kindle fires or whatever. And then, uh, and then, you know, when they, when they do eventually go see something in a, in a theater on a giant screen, it is, it is somewhat overwhelming. Where do you take your kids? Daniel? So I, Where... I take my kids to the Alamo for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that the Alamo has kid friendly shows where they relax their, you know, if you talk, we throw you out of the theater and, and maybe even, you know, shoot you. Uh, Drugs so they relax you on that. the way back to your house. And they also have like sort of, I don't know what they call it, but it's it's like a slightly sensory friendly uh, thing where they'll turn the volume down one tick and mm -hmm. they'll leave a tiny bit of the lights on, right? So they, they dim the lights really low instead of making it dark. And for for some kids, like that, that's a real help, and it's it's a nice way to see a movie. Also, they serve really good hot baked chocolate chip cookies. Um, you are a chocolate chip cookie stan from the uh, Alamo Draft House. I well, my kids are right, and so you know I bring my kids. But uh, the other thing is the presentation of the films are better. And when we go to the AMC, which sometimes we have to do because we have no choice because the Alamo is sold out or something like that. The kids notice the difference. They're like, eh, and I have to, well, you know, the problem, G-Money, is that the screen is not being masked properly. You know, like, what is, what is that what mean? Is masking, what is screen Daddy? masking? I'm like, all right, so look at those curtains <laughs> above and below the screen. They should be closed to fit the aspect ratio of the film being presented. And he's like, I don't understand that. You know, yeah. like, look at the bulb. The bulb is too dim. They they the, clearly have not replaced the bulb according to the manufacturer's schedule. So our picture is not as bright as it should be. It's like, yeah. I don't understand. What does that mean? But they notice that it's not as, as good. Yeah. You know, how about you? Are you an Alamo guy? We are. We are an Alamo guy. And you, you didn't mention the most important thing, you, which is the uh, pre-show entertainment. Your at, no, no, no. The at your service or I'm sorry, your, the at your seat service of endless rounds of popcorn. Yes. Because this is so I I uh, was never a I uh, for I would say for like 20 years, basically never bought concessions in a theater. I just don't I didn't I didn't I'm not I'm not a huge popcorn guy. Um, I, didn't, I didn't like paying eight dollars for a box candy. Um, when when I started going to the Angelica movie theater in uh, Fairfax out near out near you in, in Virginia, I started getting drinks. I would get like a beer or a glass of wine or something because I'm a sophisticated adult. Um, but, uh, once now that I've moved to Dallas and now that I live literally like three minutes from a draft house, I get popcorn every time because, uh, they, they deliver it to your seat and very importantly, free refills through the whole show. So this has been a game changing thing for my children because my, uh, three-year-old, my three-year-old son will just sit there and mechanically put popcorn in his mouth for 90 straight minutes. Yeah. Just like, hand it. You're like, how is it fitting it. in your stomach? I, I literally don't know. I literally, I, I, I think I've told this story before, but there was there was a moment uh, about, I don't know, 80 minutes into Sing 2 or something like that, where he was doing that and then like stopped all of a sudden and, and just like kind of sat there perfectly still and uh, my my wife thought he was choking on the popcorn, and like <laughs> like like shook him a little bit, and he just kept sitting there, and then sh 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 like yelped out Charlie, and he like he like kind of s s you know startled up real quick and coughed, and then just went back to shoving popcorn right back in his mouth. So I mean that is like that is a big uh, part of the experience for us. Not not merely the big screen, and not merely the you know eating food at your seat while watching. But like the the service aspect of it and the endlessness of it, yeah. like the endlessness of it is is a very important factor so for us. Can we talk a little bit about intellectual property? Because I am sure. interested in the difference in family world, kids world between streaming versus theatrical in terms of how it builds intellectual property. So you can build very valuable intellectual property just by broadcasting something over the air or over the top. Uh, Paw Patrol 
is the the er example of this. I think Paw Patrol sells more merchandise than than even Star Wars on an yeah. annual basis and has for like the last 10 years. Uh, and it crossed over from uh, streaming onto theatrical and did pretty well. Uh, but in general, I think the the way to to create valuable IP is to be in theaters and it just becomes more of an event and people you look at the the number of streaming shows for kids that are are attempted to be merchandised and attempted to to be turned into IP but just sort of don't work right like you know or they just don't catch on like spirit mm-hmm. right and i think that's because for uh, for kids something you stream on your ipad is content in the lowest it's just a pastime right it's mm-hmm. it's like the the intellectual version of white noise just you know passing in front of their eyes right you know i am i've seen this before you know you're shopping at ikea and you see a kid being pushed in a an ikea basket uh and they're just like staring at a an ipad the whole time and you just know that kid's not in taking anything going on. It's just like there, so he doesn't have to stare at endless rows of Farkvig Nugan Billy bookcases. Yep. And uh, going to a film in a theater demands a kid's entire attention and is an event. And an event that gets anchored to all of the things going around it, right? Yeah. The, we, when we went to see Sonic that time, it was it was the summer, and we had just been at the pool, and then we had the chocolate chip cookies while we were in the theater. Do you remember that, Dad? And all of these things are what contribute to people placing values on the characters and the stories and the properties, and then makes them valuable as the river flows down from that. I think that's definitely part of it. I mean, look, this is uh, this is this has been something that everybody who is obsessed with theatrical talks about all the time, which is the waterfall of revenue, where you basically have the the biggest chunk of revenue comes at the top of the waterfall with theatrical, um, and then the more money you make on theatrical, the more you can command from other. Uh, right. revenue sources so you can you can charge more from the streaming services for the rights to your thing you can charge more from the cable companies for the rights to your thing uh a huge theatrical presence means that you're going to sell more blu-rays and dvds though that is obviously a thing that is has changed a lot um the the, the revenue waterfall for kid stuff is slightly different in that it adds another level of, uh, of of payment, which is, as you mentioned, the merchandise. And so, like, on top of all of the brand building that you're doing with the advertising that you're doing for this film, because that's what it all comes down to. Like, the, the reason that these movies have... The, the reason that a theatrical pr- presentation stays in your brain longer than, say, something that gets dumped on Netflix... Um, or something that shows up on Disney Plus, you know, or something that shows up on Paramount Plus or whatever, is because you are inundated with ads for it on the internet, you know, on, via Twitter, Facebook, via on TV, via TV ads during football games and basketball games, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like you are, you are surrounded by billboards, magazine ads, whatever. Um, that advertisement uh, campaign sticks in the brain for toys as well. It's not it's not just for the movie it's for like the new Paw Patrol character uh, right. right who was in who was in that movie I for Liberty I think was her name. Right. I know because I watched that movie. I went to go see it in theaters. I've seen the ads for it. Liberty, she's huge. Everybody loves Liberty. Yeah, no that's that's certainly true. I you know, I look at all this stuff and I it's just hard to understand why we don't get more of it. Well, I mean, right? look, this, I mean, is, this is so this is but this is this is so this is what I wanted to have you on to talk about is because I I the the streaming services have made the, the I'm sorry the studios have made the bet on streaming services right Disney says Disney Plus is our thing our stock value is tied to that we need to keep adding subscribers and if we don't do that we have failed as a company and I think that the collapse of Netflix over the last uh, twelve months or so here has essentially given the studios some space to be like. Look, it doesn't the streaming the streaming component is just one 
element of our overall strategy here. Right. And there's no reason to give up the $150 million that we would make from theatrical exhibition. When even, we could just move it onto streaming eventually anyway. W- right? We're just going to move it onto streaming in three months, two months, one month, whatever it is. And we're not. that's not going to cost us subscribers because it's not like people are going to be like, well, I'm not going to subscribe to Disney Plus because I have to go pay to see Chippendale Rescue Rangers. They will either go see Chippendale Rescue Rangers in the theater, or they'll just wait six weeks for it to show up on Disney Plus. Like, there's, there's no, there's, I, I, I have yet to meet somebody who is like, well, I refuse to subscribe to this service because I have to go see something in a theater. They just don't go see it in the theater. Right. So here's, so what do you think about Pixar? So Disney has made the decision to, for the time being at least, shift Pixar releases directly to Disney+. Plus. A lot of them, though, though Lightyear is the next... Lightyear is well, the next Pixar movie that's going to... It's going to be in theaters, and but it's going to be... Lightyear is both Pixar and Disney animation. Yeah, but I mean... I, it's I the mean, first it's... co-branded. I believe the first co-branded, because those two have been like the internal... Uh, red versus blue wargaming, where you know where you have in house two sides that you pit against one another. Yeah, yeah. And uh, when Disney restarted its its you know serious attempt at animation, the Disney properties were the the red headed stepchild, and the Pixar were the golden child, right? And starting with Tangled, I think that started to move. Certainly with Frozen. Yeah, uh, that began switching, and by the time we got to Encanto this summer with like Reds or Red or what you know, turning Red, Soul, turning Red and Soul, those movies are just garbage compared to the stuff that Disney Animation is putting out. And so Lightyear takes a Pixar character in it, but I believe the the production was shepherded by Disney Animation. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not. I uh, haven't. Uh, I'm not I'm not super up on that, but uh, I will say that you you are in general right, and it is causing a lot of strife at Pixar. Pixar, oh, they're they are like they feel like they are being disrespected, that they're just being you know dumped to the streaming service. They think their movie should be in theaters. And look, I I got to be honest, I think it was a huge mistake putting Turning Red directly on uh, Disney Plus, even if it's not great, and it's not great. I don't think it is. I don't think it's particularly good. Uh, I think it's 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 a deeply annoying movie in a way that most Pixar movies are not deeply annoying. Um, but I I still think that movie would have grossed 125 million dollars in theaters, and it, it might would have. have and, and then it would have shown up on Disney Plus anyway. And people would have watched it there. I mean, I just like it, it seems like it just seems like an enormous mistake from a business POV to move all of your products. And look, there are things that Disney Plus is great for and things that Disney Plus should focus on, like, uh, for instance, the Obi-Wan series, right? Like, people aren't going to go see six hours of Obi-Wan in a theater. They want to watch it on Disney Plus. Disney Plus is, is, is a streaming channel. And things that work on streaming are TV, right? Right. I mean, like, and this is this is the broader, this is the last kind of broadest point that I want to make here, which is that, when when a streaming service focuses on serialized programming and they don't do the binge model that Netflix does, I think they are in the best shape possible. Because the whole point is to keep people subscribed to your service over a long period of time. A, a, a 10 episode serialized television show lasts for three payment cycles. Right. Right. And... What is a what is a hundred million dollar animated feature get you? It gets you two hours. Yeah, you know. Yeah, I mean, this is I mean, for Disney. Disney is unique in that what they what they really want to do is they they have you know the holy grail in in internet world is the flywheel, and Disney has a flywheel where you see a movie in the theaters, you watch it on the streaming service, you buy the lunchbox, and then you go to the theme park. And drop five thousand right. dollars, right? I mean, they they're constantly graduating, and then their super fans go on the Disney cruises or become members of the Disney Vacation Club. I mean, they are they are integrated in such a way that everybody else can only can only dream of. Uh, so, I I do want to say this about Disney: they have been more experimental in COVID times with this than anybody else. I mean, they have experimented with releasing stuff serialized. On a, which was a new thing, right? The paradigm had been dump it all to binge like Netflix. Disney said, mm-hmm. no, we're going to try serializing. 
They yeah, it did not work out very well, but they put Black Widow on streaming. Like right? they tried the premium streaming model, the, yeah. which they did for Black Widow and Mulan, and I don't think anything else. There may have been. I another think they one. did it for Raya. Maybe for Raya, Raya too, right? Yep. Uh, and that clearly did not work for them either, right? They've tried pushing Pixar into streaming only. They've kept other stuff. Yeah, like the Doctor Strange in the theaters. They've they've really tested all the different hypotheses and some things have worked and some things haven't. And I just think as a corporation, that ought to be applauded. Uh, I mean, there's certainly more experimental and interesting than, than Netflix. I mean, Netflix, is, yeah. you know, I mean, Netflix never learns anything. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if you saw this, but after the Netflix uh, stock implosion, there was an earnings call in in which uh, somebody on Netflix was like, look, we just got to make more hits. I was like, oh, oh, that's it. You no, just need to it. make better that's programming. It. Oh, so you have the you have the button in your office that says make good shows and you just yeah. hadn't been pressing it. Well, right. now you know that you need to press the make good shows button. Ah, that's, that's well, problem that's solved. All, Great. That's all you need. <laughs> no, I, I, I Netflix drives me a little bit crazy for a bunch of reasons. In the sense that I, I, you, you have always been a very, you've always been very bearish on Netflix. Always. Um, and and I uh, would always push back on that in the sense that you frequently would argue there's a decent chance they just don't exist in five years, and I still think that's wrong. I don't think that's I don't think that is a I don't think that's a a reasonable point of view. But I but I have always been skeptical of the idea that Netflix would be the the only entertainment company around that just doesn't make sense that's not how netflix is aol aol still exists right yeah Yeah, but no but aol is not not gone (laughs) netflix will not be gone it will exist because they have captured a bunch of people's credit card numbers and you can monetize that for years and years and years you can monetize that to infinity but eventually they'll be bought by somebody else because they are standalone they have no their library is basically worthless they have almost no valuable ip they have no special sauce they have no moat their moat is credit card numbers yeah. and everybody else now has that. And so what's left? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a problem for them. It's a problem for them. And I, when I see things like, you know, they, they, they spent the early part of this week talking about the, the, they're releasing the gray man, the gray, Ooh. the gray man, which is from the Russo brothers who I like a lot, who have sure. made very good movies. It stars, uh, Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans and Anna Darmus. I like all of them a lot. Ooh, another this Anna Darmus costs- movie. You know, I like Anna Armas. This movie costs like $250 million to make. They spend a ton of money on it. Nobody's going to remember this movie in, in eight weeks. It's going to come out in six weeks. It'll be, everyone will have totally forgotten about it two weeks after that. Because because Netflix does not put things in theaters. Netflix does not put things in theaters. It does not create that awareness. It doesn't create any sort of buzz. Nobody is Nobody is thinking of this as anything other than another entry in the Netflix black hole of content. Again, it, it, it becomes like a pastime, right? You watch Netflix to pass the time, not because you want to watch something. And that's different from entertainment. Entertainment yep. is not a pastime. Entertainment is art. Uh, anyway, it, look, I, the, the other thing that has always driven me crazy about Netflix is that it was valued by the stock market at like, you know, 40 times its P.E. ratio or so. Or maybe it was 400 right, right. times its P.E. ratio. But it was, you know, it was it was insane. And the the free money the stock market was giving it allowed it to go out and bury the other studios uh, in ways which were sort of competitively unfair and ultimately very bad for the industry. You now, yep. people didn't realize it was bad for the industry because if you were – there were more productions going on. And so if you worked in the industry, then you could uh, – do all sorts of, you know, you, 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 look, if you're a gaffer or a best boy or a screenwriter or an actor, there's just more productions, more chances for you to be unemployed, for you to be employed, rather. But the problem is that long term, that was not going to be bad because their their goal was to put everybody else out of business. Yeah. So. Yeah. And, and I think everybody else in the industry has kind of caught on that the ways that they save money are by paying people the lowest rates possible on these productions. I mean, they, yeah. they hire screenwriters for mini writer room seasons they they that which like kind of destroys their ability to make you know a real living um the 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 production budgets are all very tight all the money goes to stars i mean this is like the reason netflix movies so i say you know they spent 250 million dollars or whatever on the gray man i don't think it's i don't think it's quite that much i think it's closer to 200 million but it's their most expensive movie ever they keep talking about even more than their most expensive movie ever 
even more than Red Notice. But uh, but like the reason those movies are expensive is because you you it goes to paying out the back end. They they prepay the back end. So you know most uh, Hollywood math, you know, being what it is, it's all very complicated. But like in theory, stars get paid a percentage of the gross. They get they 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 have gross points. They get some you know a couple points here, a couple points there, and they get paid if the movie's a big hit. But because a Netflix movie doesn't have gross, they just get paid all that up front. So yeah. I guarantee you, let's say the budget was two hundred million dollars. Uh, I bet at least eighty million dollars of that went to pay Evans, uh, Gosling, DeArmas, and the Russos. Right. Which squeezes the rest of the budget. I mean, if yeah. you're making a big, if you're making a big uh, globe trotting adventure, one hundred twenty million dollars is not that much, really. It well, just isn't. I'm sure, they did it all on green screens anyway. Yeah. But it's, yeah. <laughs> So uh, all right, yeah, it's all it's it's all terrible. Uh, it'll be great. What, what is the next family movie we get to go out and the see? The next family with our movie kids? is Lightyear. It's not not Lightyear, Lightyear. until like yeah. two weeks from now. I mean, it's it's crazy. I guess. I guess. Do you want to see Lightyear? Uh, I mean, I want to take my kids to see Lightyear. Well, sure, I want to take my kids to see Lightyear that's... too, but I don't actually want to see Lightyear. No, like, that's it, a movie it that terrible. I don't. Sounds, that's a movie sounds... I don't need from a character <laughs> sounds... I never liked to begin with. Oh, Buzz Lightyear's great, but yeah. uh, the but I I mean I've always liked you I'm never anti- have liked a Toy Story. I'm anti Toy Story. I See, hate this is, all of the Toy Stories. This all is of one them. of your this this is one of your terrible terrible opinions because Toy Story those movies are great and uh, very very deep and meaningful. I don't know if you know this, but the toys are like parents. Yeah, I don't like them. They're watching In their the same kids way. I don't like grow up. almost any. I mean, it's not right to say that I don't like any Pixar movies, but I don't like most Pixar movies because they are emotionally manipulative. Yeah, like that is the the Pixar secret sauce is emotional manipulation, and yeah, once you that's... cotton onto that, then you, like you know you look at them and you're like, oh, I see what you're trying to do here, and no, I'm not going to fall for it. I'm not going to so cry because the old man's wife died. You weren't you weren't crying in, uh, in Inside Out when Bing Bong disappeared. No, Bing Bong, no. Bing Bong, no. Because by then I was wise to their stone. tricks. Heart of stone. I don't like being manipulated. Well, I mean, that's what... John I mean, Lasseter wants good. me to cry. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> the, the, the Pixar misses John Lasseter, too. I think yeah. we've we've discussed that as well. But story for another time. All right. Uh, JBL, thank you for joining me on the show and doing some dad movie talk. Uh, we we got to get our kids out to the theater to enjoy them while they still exist. Hopefully they, they continue. Catch Thanks. you next time. All right, uh, I'm Sonny Bunch. I am the culture editor at The Bulwark, and we'll be back next uh, week with another episode of The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. See you guys then. Just getting started with Susie Schuster has stories of humble beginnings and humbling moments from inspiring people. Angela Kinsey. Listen, I I was on set one day on The Office and I was like, we were talking about what's your good side. And I said, there's nothing really to that, right? That's like- Oh no, there is. And our camera operator, Matt Stone, that I had known for eight years, and I go, Matt, what's my side? He was like, this side. I was like, seriously? He goes, yeah. He goes, I always try to frame you that way. I was like, why didn't you tell me seven years ago? The new Just Getting Started with Susie Schuster. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.